Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, let me begin with a brief introduction uh, what Zen is and what it stands for throughout uh, history. It really starts with the Shakyamuni Buddha's original teaching, which is gaining insight by experience and awakening by meditation. These two expressions are synonymous. After the Buddha's time, soon they wrote down the sutras. And if you go to the southern branch of Buddhism, which is Sri Lanka, Thailand, some in India, very little, Burma, they have a lot of uh, sutra practice. In Burma and Thailand, they have extensive meditation too, especially in Burma. But in Sri Lanka, almost only sutra reading. However, in the northern transmission line, which is largely Tibet, Nepal, Bhutan, this is the Tantrayana version, they have the poetic and picturesque teaching methods, the Tantras. The other three Mahayana countries, China, Korea and Japan, they put a lot of emphasis on simplified meditation. Although in uh, the Tantra uh, version you also have Dzogchen, which is very similar to Zen, in the Chinese, Korean, Japanese uh, tradition, there is a distinct touch of Taoism, which is missing from the Tibetan, Nepalese and Bhutanese version. And uh, Taoism gave a distinct taste to Buddhism, and that's how Chan, or Son, or Zen was formed. So imagine two galaxies peacefully merging and exchanging views, exchanging techniques. And everything you see in uh, Chinese, Korean and Japanese Buddhism is actually a mix of Buddhism and Taoism. Without the Taoist element, we wouldn't talk about true nature. We wouldn't talk about the path. We wouldn't talk about returning to our true self. In Buddhism, there's only nirvana. The path only leads out of suffering. There's only purification, but they don't talk about nature so much. The concept of Buddha nature is almost entirely missing from early Buddhism. It comes with Mahayana. That's 400 years after the Buddha. It was really necessary to see that uh, a thousand years after the Buddha, Bodhidharma almost completely redefined practice by the four principles of Zen. Just to recall the Four Noble Truths, you have the fact of suffering, the cause of suffering, the end of suffering, and the way to end suffering. That's the Four Noble Truths. Shakyamuni Buddha began the teaching with that because otherwise people would, uh, would not have understood higher truths. And a thousand years pass, Buddhism splits into Theravada, Mahayana, furthermore Mahayana into the Tantrayana and Zen, and then you have Bodhidharma a thousand years after Shakyamuni and he says the four principles of Zen. His principles existed before him, but he was the one who really formulated it clearly and integrated it into practice. So, first of all, do not depend on the scriptures directly pointing to human mind. Attain your true nature, thus become Buddha, and transmission from mind to mind. So, these four principles actually revolutionized Buddhism, just like Buddhism in Shakyamuni's time revolutionized Hinduism and the Upanishad you know, teaching. If you look at the evolution of uh, human spirituality, you always found a great founding fathers. They were the spiritual Big Bang, whether East or West. Various principles of spirituality were formed, and based on them, more and more scriptures were made, more and more commentaries, more and more rules, more and more territorial, political, financial claims, and then everything from the Big Bang cooled down into galaxies, solar systems, planets, moons, asteroids. And then there had to be another supernova, another huge bang to renew the faith. That's how St. Francis was so necessary in medieval Christianity. And that's why renewers of the faith, they started to depend on the scriptures less. They reestablished uh, the view 
They didn't abolish laws, but they gave different interpretation to it. So without Bodhidharma and the merge with Taoism, we would not be talking about jhana today, which would be channa and chan in Korean son and Japanese zen. And that's where experience precedes thinking. That's where you do not have just a transcendental idea or a religious dogma and you believe in it. First you have insight and based on your internal experience you have faith. Because that experience holds you. It also gives you imperative to follow some deeper internal uh, morality and rules before outside rules. So the unwritten law seems to come first in this case, and the written one comes after that. What happens to one human being? We are born, we grow up, we get old, and we die. We have very short time on this earth. But look at humanity. We've been around for thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of years. We don't disappear so easily. In fact, we are one of the most potent a virus on this planet, impossible to eradicate, even if someone wanted to. So what do we do with this really strong legacy of being Homo sapiens sapiens? What do we do with our intelligence? Where do we turn our powers? How do we match our words, actions, emotions and thoughts, the four major channels of our being? For that, we don't get a user's manual. We don't get one absolute set of views. Many people tried, but in fact, all the views are relative. If you can write one book, you can write another one. If someone thinks this way, the next person can think another way. So it wasn't just Einstein who spoke about relativity. Shakyamuni and all the patriarchs and lineage holders, they also talk about the relative nature of our existence, whether it's physical, mental, in all aspects, it's relative, dependent on causes and conditions, impermanent and being imperfect. This is something we can hardly bear. We strive for something eternal, something beyond impermanence, and yet what do we get? We want something perfect, even if it's a small, as a, as a small piece of diamond. But what do we get? And we want to be free, free from binding causes and conditions, and the older we get, the more we find that we can only have that in our minds, not in our bodies, not in our existence. Cause and effect are always, always binding us from the moment of birth to the moment of death, maybe even before and after. So Zen gives you very clear insight into what is existence, what life and death are. And then you can get to this moment, you can wake up, and you can have a very different perspective of cause and effect than otherwise very different perspective of life and death than otherwise. I give you an example. Everybody think in terms of linear time. You have to be there on time. You have to live on time. We have limited time in that place or with certain people. But if you look closely, linear time expanded into cycles. Nature has yearly cycles or bi-yearly cycles with certain plants and trees. Sometimes seas with the El Nino and the La Nina effect have seven, eight year cycles. The sun has a 365 day cycle for Earth. That's how Earth is spinning around. If you look at the axis, how it spins, it's a 26,000 year cycle. Then it comes back to the same point in the sky. So linear time and cyclical time, which one is correct? If you say cyclical is correct, it's a mistake. If you say linear is correct, also a mistake. What is correct? It is 727 and counting. Just this moment, see clearly what the time is. Everything else, whether you have a linear perception or a cyclical perception, depends on your body and mind. So for some people, sitting in this room would be very, very long if they were brought here against their will. Some people who are interested, for them this talk may be very short. 
it's a very relative perception how long time is. When you were a teenager, how long was an hour in the afternoon? And when you have three children, how long is an hour in the afternoon? We have the notion of time because we are born into this body, with this brain, with these senses, with this kind of thinking and emotions. Very few people are ready to see that. We want to perceive time and space as something objectively existing. And we are not ready to see that it's really created by mind alone. Depending on your mind, you have a perception of time and space and not vice versa. The Buddha, when he got enlightenment, he put his teaching into one sentence. If you want to understand the nature of this universe, then perceive it as created by mind alone. You can read this in the Avatamsaka Sutra or the Flower Garland Sutra. But this was just one step between zero and 100%. And his first students, the five ascetics, they didn't get it. It was too simple, too clear, too radical, too different from the philosophy of the Buddha's time. They had four big schools of yoga and Indian philosophy. And this was not part of it. This was deeper than that. When the Buddha started his studies, he had two distinct teachers, two hermits or arahans, as called later. He had two hermits of his time, Uddhakaramaputta and Alarakalamo. We remember them because of the Buddha. They were the Buddha's first teachers. And he describes how he felt when he completed his studies at these distinct hermit teachers. So he said he reached a certain kind of clarity, absorption, bliss and happiness. But all these qualities did not bind his mind and didn't make him attached to these qualities or identify with these qualities. Because he wanted to look further where all this comes from. How they stay or endure and how they are dissipating or dissolving. So because of that, he went even deeper and he discarded all transcendental views. He discarded all worldviews and he got to the fundamental starting point of mind. So if everything is created by mind alone, what creates mind? That's where Zen really begins. You can have correct thinking in many ways from many sources, but where does all that thinking come from? When you look for that source, then you're entering Zen. So Zen means literally, jhana, becoming one, being absorbed in reality, returning to your true nature, becoming your true self, and thus clearly seeing, like in a mirror, clearly perceiving the real meaning of words and the true operation of cause and effect in life. All this is part of jhana. In the present day, in the world, we have very similar problems than a hundred, a thousand, or even thousands of years ago. Just the number of human beings and the attached infrastructure, that's what's different. But we humans, we struggle with the same kind of psychological, existential, emotional, cognitive problems as ever before. Just the surroundings are different. Just the externals, they changed. And if we don't find answers to them, real answers, not just temporary reliefs, then with the current potential that we have, we can make our situation either better or infinitely worse. What we know that in the long run we cannot stay like this because it's unsustainable. There was a great thinker who said, if there is a third world war, we don't know how it will happen and what kind of weapons will be used. But we know that the fourth will be fought with stones and sticks only. So now, if you have any questions, then feel free to ask. Any kind. I don't know if I got it right. You just said that um, Buddha said to understand the world only with your, with your mind? No. He said, if you want to understand the nature of this world, this universe, then perceive it as created by mind alone. Yeah, I don't really understand that. So if you... Okay. So he meant that if you look inside, you are the factory of your own emotions and thoughts and words and actions. Many times we say, I had no choice. He made me do it. She made me do it. 
or the world is like this, so I am like this. This is all limited thinking and deluded view. So without the mind, you mean like mindless? No. No thinking? Then what? Mindful. Mindless, mindless and mindful in this case point to the same quality. Mindless means no I and mindful means having some attention or deep attention. Yeah. But mindless in the Western sense means you're a fool, you're missing some things. Uh, they went off, you know, into the stratosphere. So mindless is not the word that we want to use here. No I or no ego, we can use that. But we sometimes fail to identify the notion of ego with the cognition, the intelligence that makes it. The ego is not an entity. Ego is an attitude. And that attitude is also created by us. Okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. More questions? Any kind? So you said earlier on that Taoism, I don't know, I don't know too much about it, but is it the only um, stream that's related to nature, you said? Is the largest indigenous religion that builds exactly on nature, mm -hmm. the observation of nature. And uh, they believe that human beings originally operate like nature. We just forgot about it because our minds, our intellect, our ego, our individualistic thinking took us away from that. So uh, getting back to no mind is actually attaining great mind. Mm -hmm. Great mind is the function, the way nature works. Nature, in terms of humans, it doesn't mean that you operate like animals or plants. Some Westerners believe that, so should we go back up on the tree again? No, 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 no. You attain a spontaneous, clear human function if you stop thinking in absolute zero and one, in absolute good and bad. They are all relative qualities and they exist, but we make them. They don't exist outside of our minds, outside of our own beliefs. So Taoism gave another huge simplifying effect to Buddhism, which used to be very structural, very complex. It had many systems, sutras, commentaries. And uh, when you hear a Zen master and they say, what is Buddha? He says, go ask a tree. That's where Zen begins. It's a, learn from the tree. The tree can teach you no thinking very easily. Then Master Joju was asked uh, many times, does a dog have Buddha nature? After a while he said, Mu, which means no or none. Buddha nature is a concept which Mahayana Buddhism introduced to help students. But how can you put a tag on something which has originally no name, no form? You can call it Buddha nature, but originally Buddha nature doesn't exist. It's never born. It doesn't take any form. So when we say emptiness, the West kind of, oh, it's like existentialism. No, 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 no. It's very different from that. So Taoism cuts the attachment to words and speech and returns you directly to nature. That learn from the trees, learn from the rivers, learn from the mountain. Originally, we operate in the same way, but as a human being. We follow the same laws as a human being. So if you read the Tao Te Ching, it has deep meaning. Subsequent commentaries, so-so. But Lao Tzu, we don't know much about him, but he was a great teacher, for sure. The second part, which is about society or, you know, earthly existence, then that is very instructive. How a leader should behave, how society should be formed, how the individual relates to uh, the group, etc. The first part is really about spiritual practice and uh, the meaning and the interpretation of the Tao Te Ching, or as some people say, the De Tao Ching, is really manifold. And without that, anybody dealing with the Chinese astrology or the I Ching or Chinese medicine, uh, they would be helpless. It's the cornerstone of the, I should say, larger Chinese view, not just mainland geographical China, but anywhere Chinese culture went, is the main view of the world and humans and society. And I should say it's very beneficial. It's much more 
in harmony with the way things actually are than ideologies and uh, just uh, dogmas and uh, dualistic thinking. Okay. Why it's so hard to to um, yeah to experience this uh, no mind life and how can I practice besides of um, meditations so in my real life to live. Uh, Look, uh, we are used to being attached and identified with our thoughts, feelings, words and actions, all forms of impulses, our willpower, our consciousness. That identification really stops us from uh, returning to no mind or before thinking or to a mind which has no dualities, which is clear like space, clear like a mirror. Imagine you go into the bathroom in the morning and then you look into the mirror and you see that you don't see anyone. You have no head, you have no neck, you have no body. You have no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind whatsoever. Wouldn't that freak the heck out of you? Most people would be so frightened that they look into the mirror. You know you are looking at it and there is the mirror alone. The mirror only, nothing and no one else. Well, that's the experience when you wake up from the identification to the body, to the mind, to the emotions, to the words. Any karma, when you discard it, your self-image is gone. Only the mind, which is clear like space, clear like a mirror, remains. And we are not used to that. And those people who get it, sometimes they have big problems out of it. It's called enlightenment sickness or sometimes Zen sickness. They are not identical. Zen sickness can come from extensive practicing, but only one part of that is enlightenment sickness. And they wake up and it catches them unprepared. And if they react to it out of their leftover karma, because the first breakthrough is not the last breakthrough, then that karma is really making things a lot worse. We call this Dharma accident. And many people in the West, either because they are attached to their thinking and they don't get what they want, or they get it but they react to it right away, they lose it. Sung San Sunim talks about first enlightenment, original enlightenment, final enlightenment. So first enlightenment is when you attain this point. It's the first breakthrough. That's when you're thinking for a moment, it's cut completely. Then you cannot say that you are alive or dead, that you exist or don't exist. That moment, you and this universe become one. But neither the universe nor you exist as a label. It's beyond any description. Original enlightenment is when you see that the wall is just green. The sky is just blue. The cars are just passing in the street. Everything on the moment, right now, right here. Final enlightenment is when somebody is hungry, give them food. Somebody is thirsty, give them drink. This is just doing life, just clearly responding to situations with the correct relationship and the correct function. All right. So first enlightenment, original enlightenment, final enlightenment. That substance, truth and function together. And with the first one, the first breakthrough is unlike anything else. Then you should have later clarifications. So you first break through with the drill to the other side of the mountain. Then the tunnel is done. But then you have to widen it. Go back and forth between the two ends of the tunnel many times before the roads are built, before other people can pass. And this kind of experience becomes complete when it reintegrates with everyday life, either as a layman, layperson, or a monk or a nun. That reintegration is final enlightenment. If without that, we would be isolated again in a different way. Not out of the egotistical isolation, but out of the incapability of uh, being attached to no thinking or being attached to emptiness. And you can see that sometimes. That people who got stuck on the way, 
they don't get to final enlightenment. That is, that's when the mountain buries them. That's when you get stuck in the tunnel that you actually made. You drilled it through. You put up the concrete. You build the road. You could invite others, come from one end to the other. That's helping all beings attain awakening. But if people become attached to either of these aspects, first original or final enlightenment, then they cannot attain just doing it. Even final enlightenment has to return to no moving, not acting, not making anything, not holding anything. Don't attach, don't want, don't check. And then another experience comes. So it's always going around, around, around with clarification, with practice, as it goes. Inside, however, you never leave the moment. Inside, like I said, with the relativity of time, no duration. You just meditate, just work, just help, sleep, eat, drink, activities, rest, everything one after the other, but your mind never leaves the moment, never identifies with the process, but generates the process, takes responsibility, uses the process correctly, but you never identify with it. That's one of the big paradoxes in life. You attain this freedom, but if you attain it correctly, then together with freedom you attain responsibility at the same time. With dignity, you attain humility. With awakening, you attain compassion and wisdom, which comes out of the non-dualistic experience. Without that, the path is not complete. Then we have to go back and forth between the two ends of the tunnel, the suffering and the enlightenment, bondage and freedom, ignorance and awakening, many times, many times. And that's when we feel that our job is never done. Either because you discover more and more inside, honestly, sincerely, that you have to deal with and you have to work it off and you have to put it all down. And you cannot do it without helping others. You cannot just do this on your own on a mountain because the moment you come down, all this karma appears again. So you have to do it on site in the relationship itself with the world. Then you have to retreat again and practice more. Another paradox is that if you want to get rid of individual karma, you have to help others. You can't just do this in your own little washing machine in a, in a kuti. You know? Sometimes I've seen hermits that were like anywhere between four to ten years really solitary, and they couldn't function in even monastic society anymore. It became impossible for them. They lost the skills and they were too old to reacquire them, they, they lost the willingness. The path really involves all of us. Why? One person suffers, one person has anger, desire, ignorance. That suffering comes to your doorstep. That suffering attacks you in the street, on the bus, on the tram, at the airport, in a stadium. So that's why the Dalai Lama said, until the last being has been freed, I shall be coming back to free them. Yeah, can, you, can I ask you what you mean by karma? Like, I, I've heard this many times, but sure. I really don't know. You cannot hear but, it enough. Yeah. I love to talk about it, even after like 17 years of teaching and 27 years of practice. So it's, it's a wonderful question. So what is karma? You've asked a great question. There are so many misconceptions about it. First, let me tell you a few wrong definitions. Then we get to the chase. Wrong definition of karma is fate. Sometimes in the West you can hear, that's your fate, that's your karma. They use it synonymously, and that's totally wrong. Karma comes from the word kr in Sanskrit, which as a root means action. But it also means its result. So action and result in the same word, cause and effect. It also means the accumulation of cause and effect, the formation of habits based on the accumulation, and the assembly of habits into a notion of self. The assembly of self or individuals into larger units like family, 
groups of society. Society, societies, civilizations, and then the human race. And then other forms of consciousness like animals. So karma doesn't stop with the individual. We have smaller quanta of karma. One action, one result. One thought and another thought. Emotion and reaction to that emotion. Then it accumulates, becomes a habit, becomes many habits, becomes a personality. Then the personalities become larger units, as I've said. All this is something that you do not necessarily identify with, but if you repeat it many times and you don't see it, you don't really separate the subject and the object, the actor and the action, that's how conditioned existence works. Look at extremes with soldiers, actors, actresses, Doctors, spacemen, they are very highly trained people. That conditioning turns them into who they are. And because of that, they are rightfully saying, I'm a soldier, I'm an actor, I'm a monk, I'm a spaceman. So because of that conditioning and the identification with this conditioning, karma becomes part of yourself. That's when your backpack kind of becomes the same as your back. As if somebody has sewn it on you. If you identify with your karma, you cannot become free. But if you don't use karma, how do you help others? How do you help yourself? So, karma is nothing mysterious, but if you check it, then you make judgments very soon. If you hold it, you become attached to it very soon. If you attach to it, you become identified with it, then you're loaded with wrong views and greed and anger. That's why I say that the mirror must be free from all stains. You can't put anything in front of the mirror if the mirror is clear. The mirror can take it. But if you leave marks of lipstick on it, or spots of foam on it, or any kind of layers of writing on it, then the mirror becomes limited, tainted, distorted. And when a shock comes, it can break. When the mind is weak, then it can break under the pressure of thoughts, feelings, perceptions, impulses, and consciousness. That involves all our sensory perceptions. When that happens, our notion of self breaks. Then people can go crazy, they can go rogue, they can go extreme, they can do stupid things because their integrity, their notion of self is gone. Their clear mind is gone. That's when karma, as it disintegrates the self, becomes the ruler without a head, the king without a crown, or the leader without any control. So if your clarity is gone, then you're on the autopilot of your own habits. And that's what defines crisis. When you just feel the habit force, but you have no control over it whatsoever. So when you accumulate a lot of bad karma, let's say you've done that all your life, and then you die, what do you think, where, where does the karma go? Well, let's see where that karma comes from first, because that eases up the pressure on the reincarnation theory. You can see kids with certain habits that come out like when they're two, three years of age, some are aggressive, some are talented, some are sensitive, some are weak, some love mommy, some love daddy, some love being home, some love being outside. It's all from their consciousness, from the storehouse that they brought with themselves when they were born. And as they get their education, which is very important, there's an interaction between inside and outside. The storehouse that they brought with their souls and the world that educates them and tries to put things in or take things out of their little being, educate them to be better people. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. In the case of some serious identification, you can educate them for 20 years, but they don't lose it. They are still that person. And with some other habits, it's very easy to reform them. When we die, we take our ID with us, not as a card, but as the soul itself. It has two major kind of components. One is, as I've said, the storehouse consciousness. In our system is the eighth consciousness. The first five is the first five physical senses, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Mind is the sixth. That's the 
That's the thinking, the conceptual mind. The seventh is your discriminating consciousness. That's what says this stick is short or long. The sixth consciousness attaches the label of stick to this, to this object. This object doesn't say I'm a Zen stick. We say that. Now some people say it's short or long, thick or thin, and you will remember this because you're smart and your memory works well. So conceptual mind, sixth, discriminating mind, seventh, long-term memory, eighth. The seventh and the eighth together is what we call the soul. When you have no body and no active thinking, you cannot change the labels of things. So the storehouse depends on your identification and the seventh is not just the discriminating mind. That's where your notion of self is born. This is me, that's not me. That's you, that's him, that's her, but not me. It's a very necessary and healthy distinction. But what we should be careful that our distinction wouldn't become discrimination, the differences wouldn't become judgments. When the seventh goes into overdrive, we judge people instead of seeing just plain and clear differences. When the eighth goes into overdrive, then we are loaded with memories of the past instead of being present. When the sixth goes into overdrive, we always call things various names and more names. And we find new formulas of expression, but they have nothing to do with reality. It's just verbose thinking. So when you have no brain, you have no sixth consciousness. When you have no eyes, you have no visual consciousness. When you have no body, you have no touching or feeling consciousness. When you have no ears, you have no hearing consciousness, etc., etc. You cannot operate that. The seventh and the eighth, with the sense of identification, that's the soul. What you do not identify with, that's not you. What you identify with negatively or positively, either because you love it or hate it, that's what you carry with you to your next life. So that's what you bring with yourself when you're born again, whichever body, whichever situation. And this is important to see. It's the cycle, it's like a huge water mill. Water mill have this big wheel. And this big wheel is partially in the water. The water drives it. So when we have sensory existence, it's like being in the water, in the stream of life. So when you're born, the wheel touches the water. When you reach the height of your life, it goes the deepest. When you start coming out of it, you're through your midlife crisis. And when that particular point on the wheel, that spoke, which is you, leaves the water, you're dead. Then you take a circle. And depending on the karma that you carry with you, you are born again at a certain time, certain place, certain environment, certain family. That's why I always say, you were not born to the neighbors. You were born to your parents, not someone else. That's exactly how karma works. It's very precise. Why? Because it's not dependent on opinions. It's not dependent on somebody's ideas. It doesn't depend on just one huge intelligence as we would like to believe it. It's a collective consciousness of many layers. We have the human realm, the human layer. There are other realms too. And all human beings' consciousness comprise what we call human mind. And that's where you can really understand that as long as just one quantum of this huge human energy field or human consciousness is deluded, we are not enlightened. Individually, you may be more awakened than another person. But as long as one and only one person is bound by delusion and therefore the resulting greed and anger, we're not free. You have understand what the, the concept of karma. Karma is a mixture between self knowledge, empathy, collective uh, energy, energy so, so to speak, many, many other things. But this karma never it's there always, in a way, right? I mean, this is... You make it, you have it. You make it disappear, then you don't have it. Like, let's take a certain habit. Somebody, um, somebody likes schnapps and drinks every week, every day. Then, after 10 years, becomes an alcoholic. 
So karma is there for him so much that he has to go to detox, then AA, then loses the habit and counts the days, then I've been clean for 576 days. Then the habit disappears. So these things, as I've said at the beginning, we make them with our minds. We use the environment, we use each other for that. So we're not, we're not doing it in an isolated fashion. But we are responsible for our own personal karma. So you can create a habit, keep a habit and lose a habit. They don't exist by themselves, these habits. That's why I suggest you look at uh, this work by Zen Master Sung San called The Compass of Zen. And what I have just explained with the eight levels of consciousness or the eight kinds of karma is exactly the theory of mind only and karma. That's the title. So mind alone creates all these karmas, maintains these karmas, and makes these karmas disappear. The root is within us. The environment is totally dependent on that. And then we depend on the environment. So karmas don't exist by themselves. We make them, hold them, attach to them, identify with them, check them, judge them, want them, love them, hate them. And then if we want, we can make them disappear. The question is how? Return to this point. When you return to this point, there's no thinking, no conscious emotional formations, no past, no present, no future, no good, no bad, no self, no other, no world, zero, not even nothing. Just the mind, which is before thinking, which is clear like space, clear like a mirror. And then with that mind, or which is no mind, that's why I said at the beginning, you can start taking energy and information out of karma. And when you completely separate energy, information, name and form, and you don't make them anymore, then karma disappears. But as long as we identify with our habits, you can retool them, remodel them, refashion them in any way, but those habits are still there. So that's why it's important to articulate our psychological problems. But even the best therapy in the West cannot teach you not to identify with your problem. That's a very specific Asian trait. In Asia, the articulation is missing, the classification is missing, the various kinds of treatments until recently, until Western psychology went in there. Now it was missing because they didn't think it was necessary. And maybe it wasn't in most cases, but in some cases it would have been better if we could have talked about it, how they feel, what they think. But in the Orient, until recently, they were not so much interested in your personal feelings and thinking, or detach from your problem. Stop making the problem. Don't check your mind. Don't judge other people. So there was teaching, but in a different fashion, in a different way. That taught you not to identify with the problem and then you stop making it. If you don't make it, you don't have it. So I believe that the synergy of Western therapy and Oriental meditation can give the best results. And I'm not alone with that. You can read a lot of books from therapists, from meditation teachers, etc. There are many, many schools of thought and meditation that can deliver us from either thinking about it too much or ignoring it too much, identifying with or believing that it doesn't exist. So do not make anything. That's what Sung San Suhim says. Don't make anything. Don't check your mind. Don't hold your karma. Don't identify with your habits. And when you don't do all this, then you are free. Yeah. Second question is that, uh, well, I don't, know, I don't know if it's necessary, but one of the pr big problems in our society is, is loneliness, among many, many other things. Lonel loneliness is a social problem, I think, in a way. But now I understand that uh, maybe the best, the best uh, tool against this, uh, this loneliness is not to thinking, right? It's not, not to think about it. It's, you already explained it. It's well, that's another logic which can make you lonely. Because if you don't think about a problem, it actually doesn't make it disappear, you know, by itself. So we say don't make the problem. But if you want to fix the problem, you have to apply certain tools. So first of all, 
Let's take off the backpack and see what's in it. That means you don't attach to the problem, you put it right in front of yourself and you ask the question, what is this? Where does this come from? For that you need no thinking, but no thinking is the first step, actually. Then correct thinking is necessary. For that I advise you to study the Zen circle. It has five distinct points, 0, 90, 180, 270 and 360 degrees. Zero degrees is when we have attachment thinking. We are so attached to our absolute views that only I'm right, everyone else is wrong. That's absolute intent, dogmatic thinking. Only I'm right. Then we see that, no, 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 maybe she is right or he is right, she is right a little bit and maybe I'm not that right anymore. Especially in critical times when we get hurt or we hurt others, we see that these views are wrong. Then 90 degrees is when you studied enough. At one degree you start to learn, really learn, not just read and understand, but really learn something. Then you realize that at 90 degrees you have all the knowledge you could possibly accumulate in a given subject, but if you don't do something to experience what the knowledge is about, then it has very little use, it has captured you. In the West many people are in this jail, they read Dharma books one after the other, but they don't do anything. They don't meditate, they don't associate with people. That's when the real answer begins to appear into your question. And they don't experience. At 180 you have the complete experience of what 90 degrees was just thinking about it. 180 you have it. You completely experience it. And then that starts to transform you and you transform your karma with it starting at 181. At 270 the transformation comes to its full capacity. That's when you see all your karma is totally changeable. Yourself as a notion, as an absolute entity, totally non-existent. So you have an operational personality but it can be changed in any and every aspect that you can possibly think about. And at 270 you can see that yeah, you can change anything you want but if you don't help other people then it remains very limited. It can become selfish again. So at 271 you really start to help others. That's what is completing your personal deliverance or liberation. And at 360 you're a complete bodhisattva and just doing life selflessly with wisdom and compassion. I've set this huge background in answer to your question so that we would all understand that loneliness cannot be solved by lonely thinking or thinking that would make us kind of forcibly associate with one another because you cannot just compress people in a situation to artificially reduce loneliness. You have to make people bring their own walls down and open their own gates. And that requires some skills, some training. And I think meditation is one of them. I'm pretty sure you know that uh, Western companies, whether American, European, they have team building uh, excursions. Sometimes get, they go to an adventure park and they have uh, therapists and uh, coaches and whatnot to improve corporate culture and interaction. Many times it just doesn't work. They return to the same cubicles and to the same corporate culture and they had a great time. They refresh their energy, but in fact their loneliness separation within the group continues because of the rules and views that they have to apply. I believe that loneliness can only be reduced by looking inside. Use loneliness to reduce loneliness. Loneliness comes from this extreme individuality that the West developed, starting from the Greeks and the Romans, you know, self-reliance and then whatever we put into the Renaissance after a thousand years of Dark Ages, brought out the individual who has the citizenship, who has the individual willpower and my identity and my family and my car and my house and my, 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 my. Don't take away the individuality, take away the ego. It's different. When you have someone with individual responsibility and freedom, it's great. But relearn the association with other people. And if you look inside, where does loneliness come from? Where does the notion of happiness, my happiness, sadness, my sadness come from? 
paradoxically enough, through this channel, you can meet other people. Because you find the same kind of basic human nature. So you are also looking for this, I'm also looking for this, let's do it together. So it's not something superficial, not something just external activity based. It's based on our own quest of deliverance, of freedom from suffering. Use loneliness, use individuality, then loneliness disappears. Individuality remains in a more open and cooperative form. Have you noticed that societies that really 100% look for their identity, they lose their sense of cooperation with others? Or just diminish totally interaction and become really self-contained and self-defined and self, 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 self. In, other, in the other way, if you look at very cooperative uh, nations and countries, they have a very good sense of who they are, but they don't hold it against other senses of identity. Not even their own past, let alone their neighbors. So they have a larger basis of cooperation, which is maybe just commercial interests, but maybe something more, like we are basically human. So at the human level, at our root nature, we are pretty much the same. But as nations, we are different. As families, of course, different. And as individual, of course, nobody has the same face as the other. No one, not even twins, never. Individuality and identity should not be the obstacle to forming groups and cooperating. In fact, the balance between the two is the ideal situation. If you have a group-based society where your individuality is not trained correctly, it is frowned upon, Confucianist Korea was like that, and you don't have communication between individuals in key situations. And when it happens in the cockpit of an airline and the second pilot is shy of talking up to the first pilot and reminding or warning him because it's considered an act of disrespect, people can die, which actually happens. I believe that individuality and the group can be and should be harmonized. And in fact, one of the big skills is to recognize when I am responsible and when we are responsible. When it is my potential and my freedom, my possibility or ours. Then we can avoid the unnecessary heroic attitude or the hunkering down of everybody, the collective cowardice. Okay, because these are real dangers. Heroes steal their countries and faceless crowds stop evolution. They are afraid to change. I really appreciate your presence and wonderful questions tonight. I hope to meet you for the next couple of workshops, uh, either here or at the original Light Zen Temple in Hungary. It's been a pleasure having you here, so I hope to see you tomorrow and subsequently in any of our meditation activities at your will. Thank you very much.